It is October, and millions of children will be going through the annual tradition of going to the local pumpkin patch in order to choose the orange orb that they and their families will carve into jack-o'-lanterns. It is not a small business. According to Statista, Americans spent nearly $708 million on pumpkins for jack-o'-lanterns in 2021, leaving, according to the Columbia, Missouri Daily Tribune, nearly 1.5 billion pounds of carved pumpkins rotting on people's front porches. But where did such a strange tradition begin, and how long has it been going on? It's not an easy question. It dates back to ancient traditions, mystic spirits, and strange natural phenomena, and literary traditions. All of it history that deserves to be remembered. Samhain is an ancient Celtic seasonal festival that aligned with the arrival of winter, halfway between the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice. The age of the celebration is unclear, although it is mentioned in Irish literature as far back as the 9th century. There are burial mounds in Ireland dating to the Neolithic period that are aligned with the sunrise on the arrival of Samhain, suggesting that some sort of festival might date back to prehistory. While Samhain is a harvest festival, a period when, for example, animals unlikely to make it through the winter would be slaughtered and eaten at a communal feast, it also has a special relationship with the dead, perhaps because of the symbolism of the changing season, with winter being the season of the dead. Samhain is seen as a period when the veil between worlds is thin, offering greater opportunity for spirits, fairies, and ghosts to come into our world. There are many traditions associated with Samhain across Ireland, Scotland, and parts of England, and many of those traditions have influenced the modern celebration of Halloween. Among them, the wearing of costumes and the giving of candy or treats. And so, not surprisingly, the carved Halloween jack-o'-lantern is generally seen as being derived from a Samhain tradition. The idea is generally tied to a character of Irish folktales called Stingy Jack. There are various stories, but the gist is that Stingy Jack, described in an 1836 edition of the Dublin Penny Journal, is known throughout the country for his unsocial manners. His blazing hearth never cheered the wayworn stranger, and the repulsed beggar never again sought his inhospitable door. Uh, the journal says that Jack became a byword, that is, Stingy Jack was a term used for any inhospitable person. But in the various stories, Jack devises ways to trick the devil himself by, for example, convincing him to climb a tree to get its fruit and then carving a cross on the tree, preventing the devil from climbing down, and extorts from the devil a promise never to take his soul in exchange for releasing him. But Jack also manages to offend God, either simply by being unworthy because of his trickery or, in some cases, offending an angel with his stinginess. So when Stingy Jack dies, the story goes, he's not allowed to either enter heaven nor hell, but doomed to walk the earth, provided by the devil with a single burning coal to light his way. That coal is the jack-o'-lantern. As a Samhain tradition in Ireland, Jack's lantern was represented by carving a ghastly face into a root vegetable, a large potato or turnip, often hollowed out with a small candle placed inside. The jack-o'-lantern is then imagined to ward off evil spirits. A 2005 edition of BBC News writes, In Ireland, people cut out heads and faces of turnips and hid them in the hedgerows as a prank during Halloween, and they would have carried the tradition over to America. But when they arrived in the New World, they just could not find any turnips, so they used pumpkins instead. The BBC article goes on to lament that the American tradition of using pumpkins has somehow come back to Ireland, reducing the market for turnips. The story of Stingy Jack is somewhat ironic given the way that jack-o'-lanterns are used as part of Halloween tradition today. Here's this symbol of a man who is so stingy that he wouldn't entertain travelers being used as a welcome sign for children who are seeking free candy. But while that is the most common story told to explain the tradition of the jack-o'-lantern, the story is somewhat more complex than that. For example, it isn't clear when the carving of turnips actually began. Some only date the idea back to the 19th century, meaning that the tradition in Ireland is hardly older than the one in America. However, it may be much older. A 2020 edition of National Geographic quotes Nathan Mannion, senior curator for the Irish Immigration Museum in Dublin, that carving round fruits and vegetables to depict a human face goes back thousands of years. It may even have pre-Christian origins that evolved from the custom of head veneration or potentially even represented war trophies taken from your foes. It is quite macabre, but it may have symbolized the severed heads of your enemies. That is, the carved turnips might, like the Harvest Festival of Samhain, date back to prehistory. 
and the practice wasn't just limited to Samhain or Halloween. For example, the strange New England anti-Catholic celebration called Pope Night, practiced from the 1620s all the way into the 1890s, included effigies of the Pope and the Devil, whose heads were often carved from large potatoes. And the exact point when pumpkins became involved is unclear as well. In her book, Pumpkin, the Curious History of an American Icon, author Cindy Ott references an illustration in a November 1867 edition of Harper's Weekly entitled The Pumpkin Effigy, and argues that before this time, the jack-o'-lantern, both in the guise of a devilish Irish folk character and an African-American spook, had nothing to do with pumpkin. But it actually might go farther back than that. For example, an 1893 edition of the Utoxeter New Era and General Advertiser of Staffordshire, UK, quotes an American correspondent about a story from 200 years before. In the story, 14-year-old twin sisters Prudence and Endurance Place were left at home in their rural cabin in a clearing to watch the farm while their parents took their younger siblings on a visit to Portsmouth. During the first day of their homekeeping, the girls gathered the big yellow pumpkins from the field and laid them in a pile near the back door. While resting from their labor, they, quote, amused themselves by cutting two hideous jack-o'-lanterns from large pumpkins, each seeking to outdo the other in carving the grotesque features. They stuck them on poles, fixed the candles inside, and made ready to astonish their father on his return by showing the grinning ogres at the window. He would have known what they were, for he had taught them to make jack-o'-lanterns. Later, however, while collecting a wayward cow, one of the girls overhears some Native Americans. They are aware that the girls have been left alone and plan to raid the farm that evening. The two girls hid in some bushes, and when they heard the men in the garden, the candles were lighted in the jack-o'-lanterns, and they were thrust up through the bush. The Indians caught a glimpse of the frightful faces and, filled with superstitious terror, fled, believing that they had been devils. It's difficult to determine the veracity of story that was supposed to have happened two centuries earlier, but the story implies that jack-o'-lanterns carved from pumpkins were well known in the U.S. in the earliest days of the Plymouth colony. And that story is not impossible. Pumpkins, a type of winter squash, were a staple food for Native Americans and introduced to the Plymouth settlers upon their arrival in 1620. And stingy jack aside, pumpkins are just naturally carvable. The History Channel website notes that the earliest version of pumpkin pie might have been eaten at the first Thanksgiving in 1621, although the pilgrims would not yet have had butter and flour. According to some accounts, early English settlers in North America improvised by hollowing out pumpkins, filling the shells with milk, honey, and spices to make a custard, and then roasting the gourds whole in hot ashes. Aside from finding the early origin of the pumpkin spice craze, if settlers were hollowing up pumpkins, it isn't a giant leap to think that they may have carved faces in them, especially given, as National Geographic already noted, that using round fruits and vegetables to represent heads goes back to prehistory. The story also illustrates the possibility that jack-o'-lanterns were not always tied to Halloween. An 1895 edition of the New York Times, for example, includes an old-fashioned jack-o'-lantern made from a small pumpkin as part of a Thanksgiving celebration. In any case, National Geographic notes Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, first published in 1820 and republished in 1858, propelled the pumpkin into American culture like never before. While not technically described in the story as a carved jack-o'-lantern, in Ichabod Crane's famous chase with the headless specter, he looks back and, just then he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him. Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but too late. It encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash, and was tumbled headlong into the dust. In the search for the missing schoolmaster the following morning, the hurled head turns out to be a shattered pumpkin. Many depictions since suggest the pumpkin had been carved, including the illustration in the 1864 edition of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And that depiction was even more firmly set in American literature in 1852 with Nathaniel Hawthorne's story Feathertop, in which an old dame, apparently a witch, makes a scarecrow named Feathertop from a body made from her broomstick and other sundry items, but whose head was admirably supplied by a somewhat withered and shriveled pumpkin in which Mother Rigby cut two holes for the eyes and a slit for the mouth, leaving a bluish-colored knob in the middle to pass for its nose. It was really quite a respectable face. The witch enchants the scarecrow to look like a man so long as he smokes a magic pipe. She is disappointed when the ruse is revealed by a mirror. My poor, dear, pretty feather top, there are thousands upon thousands of coxcombs and charlatans in the world, made up of just such jumble of worn-out, forgotten, and good-for-nothing trash as he was, yet they live in fair repute and never see themselves for what they are. 
and why should my poor puppet be the only one to know himself and perish for it? Hawthorne's use of the carved pumpkin to represent a charlatan who is not as they appear is interesting because that is actually more the traditional use of the term jack-o'-lantern. Jack-o'-lanterns were often used as an analogy in 18th and 19th century newspapers or something that leads someone astray. A political party might be said to be distracted by a jack-o'-lantern, leading them in the wrong direction. And a woman might be called a jack-o'-lantern if she leads a young man astray. And in these examples, the term jack-o'-lantern is commonly used synonymously with another phantasm, will-o'-the-wisps. These ghostly lights appeared like flickering lanterns that would be seen by travelers at night and might easily mislead them into swamps or marshes where they would be lost. While descriptions of such lights are common in folk tales around the world, the phenomena is very real and has proven a hazard. While not universally accepted, the general idea is that the phenomena is the result of the interaction of methane gas and lightning. Such lights have been called jack-o'-lanterns at least since the mid-17th century. The website Today I Found Out posits that this name likely originally derived from the practice of calling men generically Dick, Jack, Tom, etc. In particular, men who were lower class were often called generically Jack, beginning around the 14th century in England. Thus, when you see someone carrying a lantern in a distance at night that you see is a man, but you can't make out exactly who it is, he is literally man with a lantern. It isn't difficult to make the connection between these ghostly swamp lights and the flickering light within a carved fruit or vegetable. This suggests an intriguing possibility. Was the jack-o'-lantern really inspired by the Irish folktale of Stingy Jack? Or might the tale of the wandering soul and his burning coal have been inspired by the swamp gas phenomenon already called jack-o'-lanterns? The prospect of jack-o'-lanterns being inspired by methane in swamp gas is somewhat of an irony, as the Columbia Daily Tribune suggests composting them rather than throwing them in landfill because, they note, when something rots in a landfill, methane is released. Interestingly, these lights are also called hob lights. Hobs are small mythical household spirits, and they offer a different meaning for jack-o'-lantern as well. Hobs can be mischievous, but they are not necessarily evil spirits. For example, in Switzerland, hobs are called Jack of the Bowl, a type of house spirit that is helpful. For example, leading your cattle to the best places to graze in exchange for an offering of a bowl of sweet cream left out at night. And in Cornish folklore, Jack of the Lantern is the king of the pixies, husband of Joan of the Wad, Wad being a torch. Either may represent a benevolent fairy who will light your way to safety and provide good luck. A folk rhyme goes... Jack the Lantern, Joan the Wad, that tickled the maid and made her mad. Light me home. The weather's bad. And in fact, a jack-o'-lantern could simply mean a literal lantern, as Mannion noted in National Geographic. A practical purpose also evolved. Metal lanterns were quite expensive, so people would hollow out root vegetables. And over time, people started to carve faces and designs to allow light to shine through the holes without extinguishing the ember. That is the premise of the West Country celebration called Punky Night, celebrated the last Thursday in October in the Somerset village of Hinton, St. George. The website Monstrous explains, The story goes that wives of Hinton, St. George, went looking for their wayward husbands at the fair held nearby at Chiselboro, the last Thursday in October, but first hollowed out mangle wurzels in order to make lanterns to light the way. Those lanterns are now represented by children carrying jack-o'-lanterns, although by tradition they are made from hollowed-out mangle wurzels, a type of beet but more recently have been made from pumpkins as well. In fact, the name Punky Night has nothing to do with pumpkins. Punk is a Gaelic word for a spark or tender, and thus a punky is a lantern. And so this very strange tradition has a very complex origin. Is it a light to lead you astray or a light to lead your way home? Is the jack-o'-lantern a representation of an evil spirit or does it protect you from them? Was this idea of shoving a candle inside a squash derived from folk tales? Or might the folk tales have been derived from the squash or turnip or mangle wurzel? Or did it all start with swamp gas? Coming from Illinois, the world's largest producer of pumpkins, I'm happy to see the tradition as being derived from all of the above, as well as, of course, a sign that your house welcomes trick-or-treaters. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.